Welcome to Real Vision. I'm Ash Bennington. I'm very excited today to be joined by Peter Schiff, Chief Economist and Global Strategist, Euro Pacific Capital, and Ross Gerber, founder and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management, to debate this topic, value versus growth. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. So guys, this is an incredibly hot topic right now. It's all over my Twitter feed. It's raging in my DMs and it's raging in markets as we see the rotation back and forth between these two key styles. Uh, you know, this is a conversation uh, that is more important than ever right now because we're obviously at this key inflection point in macro and in markets uh, against this backdrop of rising inflation and slowing global growth. Constant speculation about what the Fed is going to do next, when they're going to begin to withdraw the ultra accommodative monetary policy. That's the framework. That's why this conversation is so important. And I couldn't be happier to have both of you here with us today. Uh, I know you've both been on the show uh, before. Peter, you've been on many times. Ross, you appeared on our Tesla documentary. Uh, Ross, let's start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do at Gerber Kawasaki Wealth uh, and unpack the thesis. So essentially, we're long-term investors, and we've always focused on certain areas of the stock market for growth, such as technology. So throughout my career, I've really been focused mostly on the changes that technology have had on our society through the three decades I've been a professional investor. And in each decade, we've seen different uh, massive shifts in the way our society works based off the technologies that were invented at the time. So when I started in the industry, it was the PC, and we were big investors in the PC. And then the next generation was the cell phone and companies like Apple, and we were big investors for growth in the growth of the, the mobility era. And of course, then the internet era um, uh, that began after that with search and uh, social media. And so as we've invested in these technologies throughout the last several decades, we've been able to uh, you know, make very sizable returns for our clients by focusing on growth investments where we see a rapid increase in earnings being driven by a secular change in technology in many cases. As we move forward, our main growth thesis besides technology is related to climate change and investing in clean energy and transportation. So we're now the leaders in investing in clean energy and transportation, led by our investment in Tesla that started many years ago, which has now expanded. So about over 20% of our portfolio is in clean energy and transportation. So. Our main thesis as investors is what are the main things that are going to happen over this next decade? And then what should we be investing in that will best uh, have the results financially from these massive societal changes? And so we think still technology and climate change are really going to drive these uh, changes over the next decade. So, Ross, that's the thesis. What's the definition uh, of growth investing? Just so that we can set up our terms for people who are relatively new to this space. So for me, growth investing is really trying to achieve a rate of return of about 20% or greater. So you're really looking for companies where you have earnings growth of 20% or greater on an annualized basis. So if we can find those companies at the right price, you have the opportunity to make much higher rates of return as an investor. So growth investors are more concerned, I think, about the rapid increase in earnings than valuations in many cases, um, because in a lot of cases, these companies over long periods of time, if they sustain these earnings growth, will grow nicely into their valuations, and then obviously, ideally, much higher. A uh, stock like Tesla is a perfect example of that. When we started investing in Tesla, they had losses as a company and they were investing heavily in uh, electric vehicle production and technology. Today, Tesla's on track to do hopefully $13 a share in earnings this year. And so as they've gone from negative earnings to positive, uh, substantially positive earnings, and now growing at a 50 to 100% earnings rate, the stock has gone up substantially. So that would be a perfect example of the growth thesis playing out over time. So Peter Schiff, obviously you've been on Real Vision many times. I think our viewers are already familiar with you, but tell us a little bit uh, about what you do. Well, I mean, I manage money for people and I, I try to focus again, more on, on, on value and, and dividends than growth per se. Though I have nothing against uh, investing in companies that are growing their earnings. In fact, I hope all the companies that I'm investing in are gonna experience growth in their earnings. My problem with just having a, a growth-oriented focus 
is a lot of times it's growth at any price. People are just willing to pay any multiple just to get a company that they believe is growing. And in many cases, they're not even focusing on the earnings. They're focusing on the revenue. Uh, and it's far more important to be able to grow your profits than grow your revenue, especially if you're growing your man- revenue by sacrificing your profits. And there's no guarantee that that business model is ever going to be profitable. So there's a lot of speculation when it comes to focusing on growth, especially if you're willing to pay any price to participate. There's a lot of room for error. Uh, there's a lot of uh, potential to lose. I mean, yes, you know, if you guess right, uh, you can make a lot of money. But who guesses right all the time? And if you guess right too many times, guess wrong rather too many times, you can end up losing a lot of money. I think one of the reasons that the growth-oriented style of investing has succeeded over the past uh, couple of decades is because of the monetary environment in which growth managers are operating, where you have artificially low interest rates that favor that type of investment, uh, where investors are you know, not losing out on a lot of yield to you know, bet on the come and wait for future payoffs that may or may not materialize. So these artificially low interest rates uh, and the inflation that uh, is created in order to sustain them uh, makes its way into the market. And most of it goes into the highly speculative portion of the market. And and then that kind of becomes a uh, self-perpetuating process where as these stocks outperform, uh, more money is focused into those sectors, Uh, more funds are created to specialize in those sectors. And so more money comes in to buy those stocks, the stocks go up, the performance is better, it attracts more money, which drives more uh, buying, and it just feeds on itself. And and you get this huge bubble, which, you know, I think we've been in. But the problem is, all these bubbles eventually pop, the air comes out, and a lot of the paper gains uh, end up evaporating. And I think we're at the early stages of that now. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are about to wake up and realize that the gains they thought they had no longer exist. I think we're early in the the part where the air comes out of this bubble. I think it was pretty clear that the rotation out of momentum and hyped up stocks uh, was well underway prior to uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation, you can see the big drop in the highly speculative names, you know, let's say the Kathy Wood Ark Innovation portfolio, uh, that stuff was collapsing, uh, but a lot of good dividend paying value stocks that no one had paid attention to in years, uh, you know, were moving up rather dramatically in a very short period of time. I was just going to ask, so just so that we can sort of define the terms of this conversation, of this debate, what's the counter thesis? How do you think about value investing uh, and why do you think it's so crucial? Well, you know, Warren Buffett always said price is what you pay, but value is what you get. And, you know, I'm concerned about what I get and I don't want to overpay for it. But value is if you could objectively look at a business and you can take a look at the assets that that business owns and the income that it's able to generate uh, through those assets, and you can compare the price that those assets are trading for relative to prices that have persisted in the past. What has this stock traded for over the years, over the decades? Uh, and, and, And try to come to a conclusion as to whether or not The current price represents a good investment value, meaning you're getting a lot of stock for your money, you're getting a lot of earnings, you're getting a lot of dividends, you're getting a lot of growth, or are you paying what historically represents a high price for a company? And generally, in order to get a stock cheap, there has to be some problem that is perceived out there. I mean, because people aren't selling stuff cheap unless there's a reason. So you have to have a long time horizon and you have to be able to look through a short term problem that may ultimately have a long run solution. And while people are selling because they, you know, they don't have the patience or the understanding to wait it out, you're able to get a good buy. Uh, you know, it's the you know, buy straw hats 
in winter and sell them in, in summer. You know, you're, you're, you're contrarian. And if you have a stock with a good dividend, you know, you get paid to wait. It's not like it's dead money. If you're getting a really good right. yield, especially in an environment where there's no yield, uh, every year that you patiently wait for the company to turn around, uh, you make more and more money. And then eventually, uh, the stock will come into favor again. There'll be positive news that drives in more buying. And at some point, the stock will reach a point where now it's expensive again. And you can take profits after having received uh, years and years of dividends. And you can look for another undervalued opportunity. Yeah. So I want to pull Ross back in. Uh, Peter asks this important question. Uh, what's the price that you're paying for growth? How do you think about that valuation? So for us, uh, from a simplistic viewpoint, we use a, a peg ratio. So it's the PE to the growth rate. I've been using this since I was a kid. And so what we look for is a dislocation between the PE and the growth rate. So if the growth rate is higher than the PE, then we want to own that stock. Okay, that, that's a good stock to own. If the growth rate is equal to the PE, it, it, especially if the company's growing at 20%, earnings or greater, we still want to own that stock as well. But if the company is trading substantially above a one peg ratio, we tend to not uh, be involved. And I think that's Peter's point about there's a difference between buying a growth stock and buying a speculative stock. And there's a big difference. And we own growth and some value stocks as well, like Lennar right now with a four PE and earnings growing 25% a year, it doesn't make any sense to me. We own that stock. It's a top holding in my fund, okay? But I also own Tesla, which is trading at about 75 times this year's earnings, even though it's growing at 100%. So, you know, that, that ratio is super important. So I think it's a very important thing to define the difference between buying speculative stocks, okay, which is not what we do, and buying growth stocks, which are based off valuations to uh, uh, to growth rate ratios. And Peter said a very important thing. We care about earnings here at my firm. We don't care about revenue. Revenue is a very important metric, especially for small companies that are growing. But what we want to do is we want to own companies that are on the cusp of profitability or already profitable. But we don't want to run co own companies that are running losses. So at my firm, we very much focus on cash flow positive companies in the growth space is the ideal investment for us. And by the way, I should say just for a definition really quickly. So peg ratio is the, the growth. Uh, it's growth of annual EPS earnings per share uh, that that ratio is measuring. Uh, Peter, jump in. Yeah, I, I, I think that it certainly is a better approach to what, what you've just described than what a lot of other people have been doing in just, you know, buying anything uh, that is generating uh, revenue, regardless of how they're doing it, right? If you're, if you're going to set up a business and you're going to sell dollar bills for 90 cents, you could generate a lot of revenue, uh, but you're never going to make any money. You know, there's an old uh, joke about we lose money on every sale, but we make it up on volume. And there seems to be a lot of right. managers that, that don't realize that's a joke. But, but, but see, Peter, that's the difference between me and you and a lot of money managers is we actually run a business. And so like I run an actual business every day. And if we were losing money, I know what I would have to do to yeah. get yeah. more money. You have to, you have and, to... and, and so like I think business owners who do what I do have a severe advantage over money managers. Yeah, but the point I want to make, though, is, it's, is, is that when you say you're not speculating, you're investing in growth, whenever you're investing in growth, there is a degree of speculation. I mean, everything, even value investing, involves a degree of speculation. I, I just think it's a less degree than when you're looking for growth, because the growth that you are perceiving, and maybe you've seen some growth in the past, you're speculating that that growth rate continues, but there's a lot of unknowns that can intervene that may cause that growth to slow down. I mean, you're talking about Tesla, and that's probably a perfect example. Yeah, but the same could happen with value stocks well, right, but too. It, I, I said I mean, that, but the degree of risk is greater when you're betting on growth versus you know a, a value. I, I disagree well, completely. The degree of risk is related to how well you know the company well, and how well you can model out that, what's going to happen. Let me finish my point on a Tesla. So 
Uh, you look at somebody that's innovating, like a Tesla, and, and they and they come up with a better way of doing something. In this case, you know, it's an electric car versus you know uh, a car that runs on, on on gas. And you think, hey, this is kind right, of a but, big hey, deal. Hey, this is going to be, you know, a, you you believe in it, and and so Tesla starts out, and you know they're selling these electric cars, and all of a sudden they're really growing. They start to make a lot of money. And they don't really have a lot of competition yet because not a lot of other people are doing it. But as Tesla succeeds and proves their concept is correct, all of a sudden, a lot of other established car companies are like, hey, look at all this money Tesla's making. There is a demand for electric cars. Let's come out with electric cars. And over time, Tesla's success becomes its undoing because its success results in a lot of other people copying that success, improving on that success, and eating into their market share. And so the growth that you thought was going to be there ends up not being there because it's a victim of its own success. Well, that never happened with Apple. You know, the story's not over. With some of these stocks... What do you mean the story's not over? I've owned Apple for 20-something years and still hasn't well, happened. I'm on eight years with Tesla, so I, no, I, don't, you, I don't see that as all, a reality. The, 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 your, your experience with, with Tesla and with Apple have all come under the backdrop of an easy Fed with artificially low interest rates. We're, yeah, but I was born in 1971. I've been yeah. alive a long time now. I can't change the world that I've always yeah, well, lived the, in. The, the, I wasn't born in well, medieval not, times either. I well, don't wear armor well, to work. You, you, lived, you lived through the 1970s, and what you're about to go through is going to be similar but worse than the <laughs> 1970s. When no it comes, way. Come yeah, on. When it comes to... Uh, in the investing climate. We are in a high inflationary environment where inflation is going to be accelerating throughout this decade. Uh, rates are going to be rising, but not nearly fast enough to slow down inflation. So how, how, did, they, how did they end inflation in the 70s? It was simple. It wasn't simple. You raised yeah, but, interest rates. You just yes, raised interest but, rates. So interest rates got to 20. That's all they okay, have to do. So interest rates got to 20% in 1980 when the inflation rate was 13 and a half. So we had a six and a half percent real interest rate. So if you take the government at its word that inflation is seven and a half percent, but it's really 15% if we measure prices the same way we did in 1980. But if you figure we need the same six and a half percent real rate of interest, or maybe even just three, in order to, let's say, tame inflation, the Fed's got to get the Fed funds rate up to 10% and it's got to do it quickly. It can't drag its feet because if it takes two- But you're, you're discounting the effect of technology, Peter. A lot has changed since 1980 and technology is one of the biggest driver no, no. Well, of deflation have, well, along with globalization. We, we, had a lot, you know, we had technology in the 1970s too. I know you were pretty young, but we had the transistor. Not really. We had a lot no. of stuff going on. But look, inflation- The computer chip was invented in 1971. Is, so there was like, not a lot of technology in 1978. Inflation is about money creation. It's not about technology. Yes, there's always ways to build things better and cheaper. That's what capitalism does. Capitalism lowers prices with productivity. Governments raise prices with inflation, and they create inflation by printing money, by running deficits. We have the right. largest deficits in our history. We have never had a monetary policy as inflationary as the one we have right now. We have record trade deficits. Actually, that's not true. In fact, our deficit no, is falling no, dramatically. No, it's right not now. falling. It's no, we, we're running three trillion dollar a year budget deficits. Our trade deficit, maybe. No, 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 no. That's yeah, not yes, accurate, Peter. The current. Yeah, and, and look at look at the trade. Look at the Here, trade deficit numbers. Let me second. just finish this point. Look Here, at the trade. Just, let me just because one no one's going to be able to. done. The yeah. trade deficit numbers that came out this morning, it was an all-time record high. Don't tell me the deficits are going down. They're skyrocketing. The budget deficits. The budget deficits in our country are not that big no, they're, Yes, they are. Uh, Peter, we were talking here. It seems like one of the ideas that you guys disagree on is the role of inflation uh, and its uh, and its impact on these investing strategies. Peter, give us the 50,000 foot overview of your view on where we are right now in terms of inflation risk and what you see happening uh, in the next one, three, five years. Well, you know, the inflation risk is enormous. I mean, we spent the last decade or two creating inflation, uh, but a lot of the inflation we created showed up in financial assets like the stock market 
And, you know, when inflation is making your assets go up, a lot of people don't, don't mind that. I mean, it does uh, widen the divide between the rich who own assets and the poor who don't. But in general, uh, you know, if people's stocks go up or their real estates go up, they think they're richer. Uh, but ultimately, all this inflation manifests itself in goods prices. We're seeing the tip of that now. Uh, food prices, energy prices are going through the roof. Uh, they're just getting started. Prices across the board are going to be rising at the fastest pace in U.S. history, following the, the greatest degree of monetary excess in U.S. history, which is not over. It's going to continue. And, you know, it, it's like the 1970s, especially if you consider the 1960s, because the 1960s had a lot of monetary inflation. During the 1960s, uh, we ran budget deficits, which at the time were large compared to today, they're tiny. And the Federal Reserve monetized it. You know, we, we had the war in Vietnam, the war on poverty. We went to the moon, great, you know, great society programs. And during that time, you know, the stock market went up. You had the nifty 50. You had these stocks like Polaroid or whatever were the, the, the new tech stocks of the day that were the one decision stocks, just buy them and never sell them. Uh, and everybody thought they were geniuses because they bought the growth stocks of the 1960s until the 1970s showed up and the inflation manifests itself uh, the way it is now, except now it's worse than the 70s. And you went through a decade where U.S. stocks got completely clobbered, uh, especially in real terms. Gold went from $35 an ounce to $850. Oil went from $3 a barrel to $30. The U.S. dollar lost two-thirds of its value against the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, the Deutsche Mark. And, you know, people just got destroyed. In fact, so much wealth was lost during the 1970s, not just in portfolios, but in the real decline of wages. So my point is, we're, we're at a similar juncture now. The stocks that did really well uh, during the bubble are going to be a disaster during the coming decade. Uh, and what's going to work is going to be what worked during the 70s, only in a bigger way. It's going to be commodities. It's going to be foreign stocks, foreign currencies, emerging markets, value, dividends. Everything that made people rich during the past decade is going to make them poor uh, during this decade. Ross, there you have it. That's uh, about as crisp a case as I could imagine wow. uh, for the pro-inflation yeah. view uh, and the, this rotation trade. Uh, this is like Peter's dream come true. Like you missed the 70s so I, much. I don't miss them, but you um, know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm safe to say that I see almost zero parallels between today and the 70s um, in any way, shape or form. And I think your premise is certainly uh, buoyed by this conflict that recently started two weeks ago, which has exacerbated inflationary pressures in a way that are very unique to the war that has been started. And war has caused a tremendous amount of inflation, like the Vietnam War. Um, no, the war, the war, this war wars has don't cause inflation. inflation. It, it's the way the governments react to that by printing money. So if prices go up for... So that's no, no. inflation. That's right. But the wars don't cause it. It's the governments that print money to fund the war. They need the money but, for the war. That's why right, they print the money. But they don't money. have to do it that way. They can raise taxes instead, yeah, but they, they, they choose not to. They can raise taxes. No, that they have to print the money. We printed the money in World War II. We printed the money well, in Vietnam. We printed some. We printed the money in we Iraq. Printed some money in, we printed wait, the money in Iraq, wait, We printed too. some money in World War II, but we actually raised taxes dramatically on the middle class during World War II, and the government... To pay and, the bonds off. That, no, this was before, during the war. The government raised taxes. No, but we paid those bonds yeah. off back in World War II. We after paid the war off. was over. We, after, we stopped doing that in after Vietnam. After the war was over, we did that. No, we, things changed in you know we, with uh, Vietnam and in the 70s and 80s. When, Listen, I don't want to do a history well, battle you with you understand because history, history is subjective you're, you're, and we all look at it well, differently. No, this, you, you look um, at it differently because you don't I know history very it. well. But let me just say this. Uh, the, the core point here is about inflation. So, w Ross, what's the counter case? I think that, you know, Peter has unpacked this view uh, of what he sees happening uh, in the next one, three, five years with rising inflation. What's your view of that? Because he has a very strong thesis around this idea of the erosion of these growth stock uh, valuations uh, as inflation rises. The Fed 
has used a tremendous amount of tools to support the economy uh, post coronavirus, post financial crisis. And that uh, a lot of what Peter's saying is true about the fact that many financial assets gain value more so than they should because of incredibly accommodative policies, which as policies are changing as they are now, obviously the bubble pops. And, and we're seeing that right now in the stock market. And we see that as actually very healthy. We don't look at crazy speculation as a positive thing for investors. So the Fed has a very easy tool book to end inflation if they want to. And it's simply taking away the cash. And so <laughs> as they start to raise interest rates right now, we have every confidence that it will work in slowing the economy and slowing down inflation. So basically, if the Fed can raise rates to any amount to, to, to kill inflation, then and we know that that works, as we saw in the early 80s, then they absolutely have a playbook to control and maintain inflation. Now, certainly when the war ends, which it will, because all wars do end, um, things like oil prices, wheat prices, food prices that are all being affected temporarily will come back into a more natural uh, environment. But I still think when you're talking about asset inflation, okay, it's 100% related to the Fed and what that real rate should be for interest rates. And, and that rate will determine the value of all assets. But what we, what, but remember, we live in a world where the government can't afford higher interest rates because we have $30 trillion in debt. So the way this world works isn't going to all of a sudden change to the 70s again because nobody can survive well, in you're, that you're, world, you're, including you're, our you're, government. You're proving my point. See, what I wanted to throw out, you just said the Fed has a tool and they can fight inflation if they just raise rates high enough. Well, let, so That's let's right. say the Fed is going to raise rates which right, is what no, they're but, doing. So they're talking about raising them to 1% or 2%. That, that's not. We don't know, but they're going to start raising not, rates. But that's not going to matter. That's not going to slow inflation. Inflation will get faster with these little tiny rate hikes. So let's say the Fed. Why? Why would it go faster? Because you're still having big negative interest rates. If inflation is 7 8%. No, but the cost, your cost of living goes up when interest rates go up. Yes, Mortgages but yes, and, but, and but not, credit cards go up. So it slows no, the it's, economy. It's That's not going to slow inflation. It's not going to cause people to stop spending and start saving. Because, of no. course it is. Okay, so you're telling me, let's say interest rates. That if you have to pay a higher interest rate on a house, no, you probably can't but afford the house. If, the, if inflation is 8%, right, and you're, the, the interest rates on your mortgage go from three to three and a half, you're still getting paid to borrow money. Inflation is, the, the long-term rate of inflation is not going to stay at 8%. But that's, can we agree that's on that? That's where it is right now, or okay. it's higher. The long-term rate of inflation over the last 30 years no, no, is 2 forget, to 3%. First of all, for, for, so it, maybe it goes no, above trend line and for, we're at 3 no, to 4%. Forget it, but no, you're now let's so, use a real number, so Peter. 8% no, is not a real you know number. It's higher than that right now. If you want to get real, I'm just using the government's fake numbers. But look, answer this question for me, okay? Because you said they could just fight inflation. They could put rates high enough. So let's, say, let's yeah. say the Fed has to put rates at 10%, half of what Volcker did, right? 10%, not 20%, 10%. Right. Now, so mortgage right. rates go from where they are now, you know, 3%, 4%, they go up to 11% or 12%, all the adjustable rate mortgages, right? All, all yeah. corporate- And what let, would happen to real estate get, prices? Yeah. What would yeah, happen to prices? Finish, right. All, right. Go right down. Also, the federal- the Inflation's gone. So the federal government's interest on the national debt goes from about 300 billion a year to 3 trillion a year. Now, we need a massive tax hike on the middle class. We probably have to double or triple income tax and the payroll tax just to cover that cost. So the economy's in a recession, real estate prices are crashing, companies are defaulting on their debt, right? And we won't have no, inflation. We ha but, but, this is, but is this gonna happen? Is the government, are we gonna do all this to fight the inflation? They don't even have so to come they, close to that. If they raise rates to 2%, 2%. inflation's no, it's not. done. Not even close. So, okay, so why didn't prices are going to go down? So why didn't that work for Volcker? Why did Volcker have to go to twenty percent when he could have just gone to two? 
because that was 1970. But we were this in better economic shape then than we are now. We're way worse now. Let's just take a pause here and, and frame this conversation. Uh, so, so what we're talking about here is the ability of the Fed uh, to get to, a, th there's a, obviously the conversation about seven rate hikes in 2022, uh, open question about whether or not they're going to get there. So the question on the table right now uh, is if the Fed gets to 175 basis points, uh, 2% in that range, does inflation get tamed? I want to get each one of you to weigh in on that. At 2% federal funds rate, what happens to inflation, Ross? Well, I think uh, also depends very much on the 10 years reaction to that. So let's assume that the economy is growing nicely and the Fed's raising rates, let's say the pre-war environment we had. So if the 10-year rate goes up sort of in lockstep, which we think the 10-year should be around 25 to 3% over the long term, <laughs> with, we do think inflation will average a higher rate than it has in the past, we think that that'll work. And I think the markets will show you that. But the Fed doesn't have to be that aggressive to get results because the whole society is functioning around 0%. So if our whole society functions around 0% and we go to 2 let's say, it's going to have an effect. It's going to have a, a pretty strong effect in slowing the economy and slowing inflation. And I think with all these high prices, we're already seeing the economy start to slow because of that as well. So the Fed might even not even be able to get to 1 and 3 quarters. But if the Fed gets to 1 and 3 quarters and then the yield curve flattens, you know, then we're going to have a recession and then we won't have to worry about inflation at recession, all. Recession is not the cure for inflation. In fact, historically, it worked recessions in the 80s. make inflation worse because what- Not in 1983. What, 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 so when, when you have a growing economy, you produce more goods and services and that tends to uh, keep prices lower because of the greater supply of goods and services. But in a recession, uh, the supply goes down. And what generally happens in a recession is the Fed stimulates with money printing. And so you end up with a reduction in supply and an increase in demand due to money printing. And you have a lot of inflation. In fact, if you look at countries that have experienced hyperinflation, it never happens in a strong economy. It's always in a very weak economy, an economy in a depression where you have a hyperinflation. And so we are headed into a very dangerous environment if the Fed follows through with these tiny rate hikes so that over the course of the next couple of years, we get up to one and a half, two percent. Inflation will be much higher two years from now than it is today. And so the real uh, interest rates will be even lower at two percent than they are now at zero. Now, where the yield on the 10 year will be depends on how big the Fed's balance sheet is. If the Fed doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't return to another you know, big QE program, if the Fed actually follows suit and, and, and shrinks its balance sheet, yields will be substantially higher. I mean, you won't even be able to see 3% you know, with a microscope. But so why are all these institutions buying bonds right now? I remember when I was shorting the subprime mortgage market and, 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 and advocating that people do that. And we were living in a housing bubble and people own these mortgage bonds. And people said, well, why are people buying them? Why are they paying par? I said, because they're fools. They have no idea how much money they're about to lose. Uh, people are on the precipice of historic There's a lot losses. of people in the treasury market. Look, people are going to lose a lot of money that don't understand this. You know? And even the money they don't lose is going to lose a lot of value. So this is going to be a game changer for a lot of people who can't read the writing on the wall and don't understand the bubble nature of what we've just experienced and where we're headed is reality. And reality is going to look a lot different than this fantasy. The, the, well, the S&P is actually trading at its historical PE right now. Yeah, but when, we're, when we see the dollar crash, right, and a loss of reserve currency status. The dollar is rallying it, it, right yeah, now. It, this is its swan song. It's rallying on this flight to quality uh, over what's happened. It's because America's the no, best game it, it, in town, it's my not friend. The best game. You 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 play that. We are. We're, no, the, we're the best the, game we, in we're town. We're the biggest debtor. We've got the biggest trade deficits, the biggest budget deficits. We've got the biggest bubble economy. We're being supported by the rest of the world, and the rest of the world is going to withdraw that support, and our economy is going to implode. And if you don't understand that, well, you're going to go down with the ship. Haven't you been saying this for a long time? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been. Yes, I've been saying it for a long time, and I've been right. The economy still hasn't imploded. But, but all the problems have gotten worse. So it's going to be an even bigger implosion.
let me jump in here just to, just to summarize a couple of points, because I think it's been an incredible amount of important uh, points that have been made here. Uh, so first, obviously, the Fed balance sheet uh, now a little under half uh, of U.S. GDP at about nine trillion dollars. Uh, U.S. GDP around 20 trillion dollars right now. Uh, second important point, there's this core, uh, I think, disagreement between you guys on the merits of the facts about this point. Uh, Ross makes the point uh, that inflation uh, is cured by recession. Historically, when you see uh, when you see recession, you see declining prices. Peter makes the case for a 1970s style stagflation uh, type environment whereby right. uh, you have this, uh, you know, Ross also making this case almost that the, the U.S. is the, the cleanest shirt in the pile of dirty laundry. Uh, Peter Schiff sees yes. a dirtier pile uh, more generally. Let me go first to Peter and then back to Ross. In terms of that summary, how do you, uh, how do you uh, respond to that notion? Which notion? Well, the idea that first, uh, the Fed balance sheet is a substantial problem. Uh, and second, that specifically that that recession is not the cure for inflation and that we may be moving into a stagflationary environment. The, the balance sheet is a huge problem. And it's something that I predicted, you know, when the Fed first made the mistake of doing quantitative easing, I, I said that we would be here. I predicted a $10 trillion balance sheet back then, and we're almost there. Uh, when yeah. the Fed did the first QE, I said they would never stop. There would be QE2, QE3. I said we'd have more QEs than Rocky movies. You know, when when Bernanke lied to Congress and said he wasn't monetizing the debt, I said, no, that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, Bernanke pretended that the government buying bonds was temporary. I knew that it was permanent because once you start this drug habit, you can never give it up. And, you know, the more drugs you take, the more you need because you, you build an economy that's even more addictive and more dependent on that drug. That's why we can't take it away the way Volcker did to fight inflation. We're going to overdose on this monetary heroin. And the real risk is a hyperinflation. Uh, and and the, the, the economy is going to go through a protracted decline. And what a lot of people focus on on inflation and recession is they think about, oh, well, demand goes down during a uh, recession. Well, supply is going to go down even more when the dollar crashes and all those goods that we used to import aren't coming in anymore. I mean, imagine all the shelves that are completely empty because we can no longer afford to import the products that used to fill them. Then the products that we do make are going to be exported because the dollar is going to be so low that whatever we do make, somebody in some other country is going to outbid somebody in America. So even though Americans are broke and unemployed, prices are going to be going through the roof because of the weak dollar and our lack of domestic production. So it's going to be not just stagflation. I've been saying it's a inflationary depression, right? We're going to have the economy <laughs> of the 1930s, but worse, with the inflation of the 1970s, but worse. So that's where we're headed. Now, there, there are solutions to this. I mean, they're, they're, none of them are painless, but they involve dismantling most of the federal government, returning to free market capitalism and sound money. And, you know, we could eventually dig our way out of this hole. I mean, capitalism is a fantastic tool if we can unleash it. Uh, but what we've been living under is not capitalism. And the disaster that we're headed for <laughs> is not a function of capitalism, but socialism. We did it to ourselves with central banking and, and central planning. Ross, your response. Wow. You know, I'm not bringing Peter to any parties, man. You know? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fun at parties. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you know I, this doomsday scenario, you know, predicating the rise of Nazi Germany is pretty much what you just described. Well, who's talking about Nazi Germany? Germany. And, yeah, you mean. Well, you just described the 1930s in Germany environment. And I don't I don't think that that's what we're going to here in America. Well, well that's the 20s. So that's the, the, the balance sheet. Of Republic. I'm talking about the 1930s as, in the as US. Far, as far as the balance sheet is concerned, you know, it's a really troubling reality the role the Fed has come to play in our economy due to, I think, many reasons that are self-serving. And the best thing we can do right now is lower the balance sheet of the Fed, because that will also have the same effect of lowering the inflationary pressures that we have by actually having the Fed get out of the long side of the bond market and letting those rates rise as they need to, to cut demand. Right, but that creates a problem, right, for all the debtors when interest rates go up. 
it doesn't create a problem at all if you do it in an orderly fit manner because the demand for bonds is still huge right now. People are buying bonds at one and three quarters yields even with your 7% inflation. Well, that's because so the central if banks the Fed are has buying. that demand for bonds, they should use the opportunity to sell off their, their balance sheet in an orderly manner so that they're not manipulating the long rates anymore. So what I see the Fed needing to do is this combination of actually exactly what they're gonna do, which is slowly raise interest rates and slowly peel off this balance sheet so that you're not pulling all the drugs out of the party at the same time, okay? We need the methadone treatment to get off the Fed stimulus situation, but we have a very strong economy right now it's as strong as I've seen it maybe in my life. I have not seen the demand for everything. Like it's amazing demand, whether it's Disneyland or a, a house in Puerto Rico for spring break. I would love to get a house in Puerto Rico for spring break. If you can find me one anywhere on your damn island for rent, yeah, look, I am there. That is how much look, demand is all, out there it's in not, the United yeah, States but, right let, now. Let, let me, so we're at the beginning of a you, boom, Peter, a huge okay. boom. So get used I, to it, my man. And there's inflation look, when there's look, growth. And that's not bad me, either. It's not bad let, to have inflation. Inflation. If you okay. have a massive this, growth, the economy is growing six, okay, look, seven percent yeah, right look, now. Never look, happened. Look, Never look, happened. My house in Puerto Rico has gone up seven x since I bought it a few years ago. So yes, it's a bubble. But what you're talking about right now, it's not a bubble. I can't find a house okay, in Puerto Rico what, anywhere. What you're talking about right now is not growth. Right. This is a bubble. If we had a strong economy, we would have trade surpluses, not deficits. You know. It, no, we buy our stuff because from China. Because We're our economy Chinese is clothes. too weak to produce it. This is a gigantic. No, we don't have. Have you ever manufactured it, clothes in LA it, before? It costs five look, times look, more. It's called we, globalization. This is the weakest the US economy has ever been. That's the reality. We are bleeding red ink. We are living on life support. You this need to get off fantasy. the island, my man. No, no, no. Come to LA. I was just, Come to LA. You can't get a reservation anywhere. I was just anywhere in LA. I'm telling you, you are living in a fantasy land and you're about to meet. The reality it of it is. End. It's a wonderful no, no. fantasy land that's busy. The traffic is stopped yeah, everywhere, the, even you know with what? gas look at seven dollars. Go and look at the ports. Look at all this stuff that our weak economy Pack. is incapable of producing. It's the strong economy. We have a backlog of ships. We're not, we don't even own those ships. Those are foreign ships, foreign flagged, foreign built, full of products that foreigners made, and they go home empty because our weak economy produces nothing. This is the biggest bubble in the history of the world, and you have no clue. This is way Peter, worse than visit. the housing Peter, bubble. Peter, you got to come visit me. Come visit me. I will show you the you, economy. Not, you, it is unbelievably good. Not, what, what are you going to show me? Restaurants where people are eating? I'll show you the whole, the whole city. <laughs> the whole city. Everywhere you go. Yeah. Yeah, you want to see it? You got to go. Guys, to we should do a we should do a we should do a stuff. mutual tour uh, where uh, Peter goes to L.A., Ross goes to Puerto Rico. An It'll be a lovely. Tour. He can't. He can't. You he can, can't like, afford uh, Puerto Rico though. It's too expensive. I can't. There's no nothing for sale. It's all sold Look, out. Look, I got a condo. Hotels, Look, you know, you, you, you know, I'm, I I might get I might give you my my house for sixty million. I don't know. I, I I'm thinking about it. <laughs> my condo. I got a small condo for, you can take for twenty five million. When you get real uh, power. Yeah. Let me ask you guys this question here because we've had a great conversation uh over the last 50 minutes or so but i want to bring it back to the core we should do that it would be such a good show if peter came to la and i went to puerto rico and we did yeah. a tour i would love that i want to host so let me just ask you guys uh this question to relate this back to the core conversation we're having here i think we've uh actually quite clearly heard two very distinct views of where the u.s economy is so tie it back uh peter and ross to this idea of value versus growth stocks. How does it fit in with the thesis first to you, Ross? Well, first of all, value stocks are now expensive. So, you know, value kind of became growth now. And so you have the opposite with oil prices at 125 and Exxon and all these companies going through the roof. They're not actually cheap anymore. And all the tech stocks that we own in clean energy is actually really inexpensive relative to their growth rates. So it's actually, a, I think, a wonderful time to look at your portfolio and rebalance depending on what you own. So, you know, we don't own oil because ethically it's like the worst thing in the world. So, but we do own gold and, and other commodities that have done very well. And, and so, you know, now we're looking at shifting out of those back into our tech names. And so I think with every portfolio, 
you know, you want to have a balance between growth and value too, but we still look at earnings growth and what we're paying for that growth. And so I think this is a great time for investors to assess stocks like Google, for example, which when you look at the PE to growth rate are extremely attractive if you wanna be in the technology sector. And at the same respect, if you're in the commodities business, this is as good as it gets with us banning Russian oil and a whole war. So you want, maybe wanna take profits like Carl Icahn did selling his oxy stake this week, which was super smart, made 1.5 billion. So, so I think it's a good time to maybe sell your value. So I've got a great Peter Schiff question. Peter, the question to you is this, why value stocks and not gold? Uh, why not shotgun shells and Kruger end if the world looks this ugly? Well, um, you know, you, you should have some, uh, some ammunition stored up and some, you know, some, some food and things like that. You know, but that's, you know, how much money can you invest in ammo? I mean, the prices will probably go up. You know, on my, on my podcast for the last year, I was advising people to go stock up on toiletries and, you know, anything that you would need because I thought prices were going to go way up. And now you can see a lot of these, uh, you know, products are up 20, 30, 40% over last year. So it's not a bad investment. But, you know, there's only, there's only so much shampoo and shaving cream you can put in your medicine cabinet. So, but... Um, as far as you know, value and, 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 and growth, first of all, a lot of these uh, gr growth stocks are still not cheap. I mean, they've come off their highs, so you can say some of the froth is out of the market, but not enough. I mean, and there's still too much complacency out there. Again, you got Kathy Wood claiming she's a deep value uh, you know, manager. I mean, I, wait, I'm waiting for her to be out of a job before I start looking at some of these stocks. Uh, they got a long way to go. We're going to have a lot of bankruptcies in the tech sector. Remember, a lot of these companies have never made any profits. They've been funding their losses by selling stock. That's going to go away. So there's a lot more downside in that area before it really becomes attractive. I agree that some of the value stocks were picking up prices prior to what just happened. But we've seen a pretty good move down in the last week, particularly in Europe. A lot of these stocks are, are now very cheap as far as I'm concerned. I mean, not the ones, not the material, the commodity ones that are going up, because obviously there are some winners and losers. Like LVMH, for example. But, but there are companies where the stock price has discounted a far worse outcome than it's even possible I mean, other than maybe, you know, a, a nuclear war. And of course, if we have nuclear war, then none of this matters. But if you look at what's been factored into a lot of these stocks, I think that they've more than compensated for the worst case scenario. So I think there's good values right now in a lot of these dividend paying value stocks. But I think that they're going to become even better values as time goes on, especially as inflation really picks up. Because the companies that you want to own in an inflationary environment, are the companies that have the pricing power where the consumer is going to keep buying even if the prices are higher. They're going to cut back on other things. So you mean Tesla? Because Tesla has well, pricing power and it cuts people's no, cost you know of what? living by $5,000 yeah, a year. Can, wait and a they have wait a, a minute. moat that nobody yeah, can if, get around if, and increase if production. If you can come up with the upfront. Wait you a minute, let me finish Tesla what I'm either? saying. The, the problem is a lot of people won't be able to afford to buy a Tesla or any car for that matter, the costs are gonna go way up. They're, they're, they're gonna be out. stuck with their old cars. In fact, you know what a lot of Americans are gonna do? They're gonna get bicycles. They're not gonna be able to afford to drive their cars. They're just gonna be riding around in bicycles. That, that's the- yeah. Arkhamoto, so, we have Arkhamoto's electric yeah, yeah. bikes, electric yeah, three wheelers. The, the, this is, the, this is the, 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 the growth future. company. But so I wanna own companies where people are going to pay the higher prices, they're going to cut back someplace else. So I don't want to own the businesses that are losing sales because their customers are spending too much on food. They're spending too much on energy. They're spending too much on insurance and rent and taxes. They've got nothing left and they can't borrow because credit's dried up and interest rates have gone up. And, and, and so th this is the environment we're going to be in. But the best places to be are going to be outside the United States. It's the foreign economies, the emerging markets. Uh, they're going to do well as the dollar sinks. Those currencies are going to rise in relation to the dollar. So their cost of living is going to fall as the American cost of living rises. The stuff that we can no longer afford is going to be bought by consumers in other countries. And so you want to own businesses that can profit from selling stuff to wealthier foreigners, you don't want to get stuck with the businesses 
whose American customers are too broke to buy their products. Ross Gerber, are you bullish international stocks? Can we get out of here on a limited point of agreement? I am super bearish on international stocks. Everything you said, I completely disagree <laughs> with. I think Europe's in severe issues now with their reliance on Russian energy and the inflation issue and the stagflation issue is actually real for Europe. And, and I think that their economics and politics make it extremely difficult for companies to do well there. Where here in the United States, um, people have been getting massive raises on the low end of our society, on the lower income end. Um, the average income and the average minimum wage here in Los Angeles has moved up to $25 an hour. People are have more money, especially lower income people, are all getting raises. We're literally competing for hiring. Like we just offered somebody a job and they went back to their old employer and then their employer gave them a raise. And then we said, they didn't recognize this. We'll give you a little bit more. And then they came and decided to come back. When does that happen? So Pete, and this is not a high level job. This is a low level yeah. job. So there's competition for wages and people are making way more money and they're spending Yeah, but they're it. not producing um, more. So this is a really we're, we're, we're earning time more, but not producing more. That's why our trade deficits are exploding. This is all a fantasy. No, because people are that buying stuff. Make, that's why it's that exploding. They didn't produce the money stuff that we print. Foreign. This is this is a disaster. You, you you just don't recognize it. Well, we like wine from other countries and clothes from other countries. Yeah, but and we, toys how do we pay countries. for it? They, 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 we, we can't. We have to make stuff. So, guys, you came for a spirited debate, and you absolutely got it. I felt like the referee in a heavyweight championship bout. Great conversation, Peter Ross. Thank you both for joining us. Okay, take care. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.